Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar on heart monitoring and cryoablation treatment for atrial fibrillation. I'm Melanie Truhills, founder and CEO of StopAFib.org, an AFib patient advocacy organization. I'm honored to be your moderator for today's program. As you all know, September is AFib Awareness Month. Living with AFib can be challenging, and the more we all know about AFib, the better we can partner with our physicians to make decisions regarding our care. So our goal for AFib Awareness Month is to bring attention to this life-altering condition and to help people living with AFib to learn more about it. Thank you to Medtronic for hosting this important educational webinar during AFib Awareness Month. We have an exceptional speaker today, Dr. Asim Desai, an electrophysiologist from Providence Mission Hospital in Mission Viejo, California, and a special guest speaker, Michael, who is one of Dr. Desai's AFib patients. But before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. If you'd like to expand your viewing page, you have two options. First, you can select the three dots or three stripes at the top right of your screen for a drop-down list. Within this drop-down list, there's a row called Zoom. Click the plus sign to make the screen bigger or the minus sign to make it smaller. Or if you'd like uh, if you'd like the viewing box to be full screen, click the icon at the bottom right of the viewing box. Then to revert back to the screen you see now, so you can submit a question, click escape at the top left of your keyboard. If you have questions during the webinar, please submit them in the Q&A box on the right side of the video window. We'll try to answer them during the webinar. And if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later by email. And to get right to the point and make it easy for us to call through all the questions, you might start your question with, my question is. Also, please know that we're recording today's webinar and the replays will be available soon. On this slide, please take a moment to note Dr. Desai's disclosures. We also want to remind you that the results described in this presentation are unique to these patients. Not every patient responds the same and results may vary. And always please talk to your doctor about your condition and the risk and benefits of the Medtronic products and treatments described in this presentation. This presentation was developed for a U.S. audience, and not all devices and treatments are approved for use in all geographies. So now let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Asim Desai. Dr. Desai has been a practicing cardiac electrophysiologist for over 18 years. He graduated from Northwestern University Medical School and did his internship, residency, chief residency, and cardiology and electrophysiology fellowships at Stanford University Medical Center. Dr. Desai served as assistant professor of medicine and Director of Implantable Device Therapy at the University of Chicago. He currently practices in Mission Viejo, California at Mission Heritage Heart Rhythm Specialist. And Dr. Desai recently published a book entitled Restart Your Heart, which I have here. I had the privilege to be one of the first to read the book long before it was published, and it's a wonderful practical guide full of great charts and easy to understand explanations for anyone living with AFib and for their loved ones. So with that, let me turn the floor over to you, Dr. Desai. Thank you so much, Melanie, for that kind introduction. I'd like to thank Medtronic for sponsoring today's event and for creating the technology that allows us to save lives. I'd like to thank Melanie and StopAFib.org for doing amazing work in advocacy and education for people with atrial fibrillation. And probably most importantly, I'd like to thank my patients, Michael joining us today, and all the people I've had the pleasure of partnering with to help improve their lives related to AFib and heart disease in general. You've taught me just as much as my medical books have. And so 
we're on a journey today. And let's talk about AFib, let's talk about the heart, and let's talk about our overall health because it's all interconnected. The heart's connected with all other aspects, mind, body, spirit, all your organs, and we need to have a holistic view to it. So as Melanie said, I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist or heart rhythm specialist in Southern California, and particularly have an interest in atrial fibrillation, both diagnostic and treatment. I do like to approach AFib as an imbalance of the body, so to speak. So we need to look at triggers and risk factors and the whole patient to have a really good outcome. And there's a lot of scientific studies that have now proven that. And lastly, I wanna mention the fact that I'm a physician, I'm also a patient, I'm also a family member. And so I understand those different perspectives of the healthcare system. And a message that I wanna to send to all of you out there is you are not alone. There are many people that have atrial fibrillation or at risk for it, and there is hope. We have many different treatment options. AFib is an individual condition and it needs to be individualized to the patient. And most importantly, really need to take care of yourself in addition to your heart. I said it from, from the heart. It's really from the standpoint of me being a patient with my own health issues that living with a health condition is a combination of accepting it, having hope, and most importantly is making a game plan to deal with it. And that game plan doesn't just involve you and your healthcare team, it involves your family and your friends to create a true team approach to dealing with health issues. And so let's talk about Esther. So Esther is a wonderful woman. She's from Germany and she's a retired school teacher and 80 years young. She has a history of high blood pressure and she was actually referred from a doctor at another hospital up in North County, Hoag Hospital. And she was referred down to Mission because we had a couple of technologies that weren't available elsewhere in Mission Hospitals, the one I work at. She had high blood pressure. She presented one day with terrible chest discomfort, shortness of breath and fatigue. And the first thing they do when you go to a doctor's office is check your vital signs. Her heart rate was 120 beats a minute and irregular. She had swollen ankles on exam. And one of the first tests that we'll do to check out the heart is an EKG or an electrocardiogram. Before we talk about Esther's EKG, let's talk about the heart. So the heart's an engine and it's very simple and it's very complex. So as an engine, it has a pump and we measure that pump by something called the ejection fraction or EF. It has valves, it has four valves, and those valves can become narrow or leaky, and that can contribute to all sorts of rhythm issues. And then you have plumbing, you have the three coronary arteries, and there's an interface and a dance between the plumbing and the electricity. If you have a problem with the electrical system, it affects the plumbing and vice versa. The electrical system you can see on the right side of the slide, and it starts up in the upper right-hand portion of the heart, the right atrium, in an area called the sinus node. And you have impulses that go down the center to a structure called the AV node, which is almost like a toll booth. It controls your impulses from going too fast or too slow. And then it branches into the two sides of the heart, right ventricle and left ventricle. And AFib or atrial fibrillation originates from the top left chamber in the vast majority of cases, which is the left atrium. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So the EKG, I mentioned that that was done in Esther's case to figure out what was going on. It's a bird's eye view of what's happening in the electrical system of the heart. You have electrodes that are placed in different parts of your body and each of those stickers, each of those electrodes is seeing your heart's electrical impulses from different vantage points. We also use it to diagnose heart attack and a variety of other medical conditions. It is the gold standard for detecting someone's rhythm and assessing abnormalities. Just like any other engine though, the electrical system is something that can be tricky. You can have issues come and go, just like in your house or in your car, something may be acting up at home. And when you go to get it checked out, it's totally fine. And the electrical system is the same. So just because you go in to have an EKG in a doctor's office and it's normal, doesn't mean the electrical system is normal. And AFib is just like that. It's a tricky condition. It can come and go and often we do not appreciate the fact that it may be happening because we're just doing the EKG in the office. That being said, in Esther's case, when she presented with this condition, we can see these are the different vantage points. These different letters that you see are the EKG leads and they show different 
views of the heart's electrical system. And one of the things that we see right off the bat is these spikes are the two ventricles contracting. It's called the QRS complex. And you can see it's totally chaotic. We have long intervals, we have short intervals. And then the other thing that we see is the absence of something called the P wave, which we'll talk about in a second. This is diagnostic of AFib. You can make the diagnosis of AFib just looking at Esther's EKG here. So what Esther's EKG tells us is on the left, a normal EKG is in the center. And if we look closely, that top line is Esther's EKG. We almost see what looks like noise. And then we see these two spikes, which are the two ventricles contracting. Each of these represents a heartbeat, essentially. So your pulse rate is defined by the number of spikes that we see in a given time period. Well, in a normal EKG, at the bottom with the purple arrow, we see this little hump, we see a spike, and we see another hump. This is an individual heartbeat, and that little hump is the P wave. This is the holy grail of heart rhythm disorders. This is reflective of what we call normal sinus rhythm. And so you can see the difference that with a normal EKG, you have even distance between the spikes, even heartbeat. And with atrial fibrillation, you have a very chaotic heartbeat, and you go from this sort of normal, organized looking signal to something that almost looks like noise. And so atrial fibrillation is one of the most common heart rhythm disorders worldwide. It actually affects about one in four people over the age of 40 at some point in life. And if we look at atrial fibrillation, I alluded to it earlier, on the right side, we have AFib. On the left side, we have normal, what we call normal sinus rhythm. AFib originates by and large from an area called the left atrium, which is on the left side of your heart. And the left atrium takes blood that was just oxygenated from the lungs and delivers it to the left side of the heart so it can pump blood to the rest of the body. And there are four veins called the pulmonary veins, which act as a source of triggering AFib. And that's often a target for both drug therapy, as well as what we'll talk about later, catheter ablation. Here on the left, you see that individual heartbeat. You see what I was referring to with the P wave, which is a sign of the atria contracting and activating in a normal fashion. So AFib, the, the, the key three things about AFib, it can cause stroke. That's the most catastrophic. So if you look at people who come into the hospital with the stroke, about 30% of those cases, we can't find the cause. The person comes in, we do all the tests, the CAT scans, the MRIs, we can't find a cause, we can't find a blockage. Well, in about a third to a half of those patients, we now know it's due to AFib. AFib can be silent. And I'll use this analogy a lot during the lecture. AFib is like cancer. It's like electrical cancer of the heart. When it starts, you can go in and out of AFib. You can have episodes of AFib called paroxysmal AFib. And then as these episodes continue, you have more and more abnormal circuitry develop until you go into it continuously, which is called persistent AFib. And so when these people come into the hospital with the stroke and we can't find a cause, in many of those cases, it's actually due to an AFib episode that may have occurred at home that they were unaware of. Another big piece of AFib in terms of adverse consequences is congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is basically where the heart cannot pump blood to the rest of the body to support vital organs. And you can have two types. You can have what we call systolic congestive heart failure where the heart muscle is actually weakened. And then you can have heart failure with the preserved ejection fraction, which means the heart muscle is stiff and it can't fill up with blood. And AFib can actually contribute to both. In particular, when the heart rate goes really fast and irregular, that impacts the pump performance of the heart and that's what can result in congestive heart failure. And then you'll hear later today from Michael, and I can guarantee you with many of our other patients that it really impacts quality of life in so many different ways. You know, the idea that you have this erratic heart condition and you never know when it's gonna hit you, that can be extremely stressful. And then just the amount of symptoms that it can produce, symptoms which can vary person to person. It can present with, simple fatigue. In fact, we see that quite commonly that people have no cardiac symptoms. They just feel tired. And there's so many things that can cause you to feel tired, poor sleep, poor hydration, stress. Well, in some cases, and again, that engine analogy, atrial fib can just cause fatigue because that engine is not pumping blood out to the rest of the body. In some cases, people feel what we call palpitations, feel the heartbeat going fast or irregular. 
In some cases, people can feel short of breath, especially with physical activity, because in physical activity, it's normal for our heart rate to go up. Well, if your resting heart rate is 100 or 110 due to AFib, and then you're starting to become active, that heart rate can go up to 140, 150, 160, and you can imagine it can cause shortness of breath. If you were to check your pulse, either looking at your radial artery or your carotid artery, or to use a wearable device like an Apple Watch, you will see that it's a rapid pulse and it's an irregular pulse. But the fast heart rate is not seen in everyone with AFib. The irregularity is seen in most cases. People can have high blood pressure, they can have low blood pressure, they can have normal blood pressure. And so that fatigue factor, that analogy I use to cancer, people can have a whole host of symptoms or no symptoms, or maybe the first time AFib is diagnosed is in the setting of a catastrophic stroke. So if we look at the kinds of AFib, and we chatted about this a little bit ago, there's paroxysmal, which is at the top here on the green. That's where you go in and out of AFib. That's sort of the early onset of cancer. And these episodes can be triggered by a variety of things, dehydration, alcohol, it turns out is a big trigger, lack of sleep, electrolyte imbalance, or there may be no triggers in some cases. And these episodes can cause symptoms such as what we talked about, or people may have no symptoms at all. And if they go to the emergency room for something or a doctor's office for something and they happen to be a normal rhythm, we wouldn't necessarily think AFib is going on. So it can be really tricky. And this is really where heart monitoring is critical in the setting of paroxysmal AFib. Persistent AFib is where you're in it continuously. So again, using that cancer analogy, as you have AFib episodes, there's a term AFib begets AFib. The heart is a muscle, it develops a muscle memory for AFib. And our job is in many cases, if our goal is to get people into rhythm and keep them in rhythm, which is the goal in some cases, but not all cases. If our goal is that, we wanna shift that muscle memory over to normal sinus rhythm. So persistent AFib is kind of like metastatic cancer in a sense, but metastatic cancer that can still be treated with a variety of different treatments. Permanent AFib isn't so much a state of AFib, it's more about a decision. So permanent AFib is saying, doctor and patient talk together. We look at the risks and benefits of treatment of AFib. We look at a patient's symptoms, quality of life, how it's impacted by the AFib, and we decide together, you know what, maybe it doesn't make the most sense in this case to try to get you in rhythm. Or maybe we've already tried to get you in rhythm with a shocking procedure called cardioversion or meds, or a procedure, like I mentioned, called ablation, and the AFib keeps coming back. Maybe in those cases, we keep someone in AFib. And that is a treatment strategy that is making a decision about quality of life and risk to benefit. So it's not giving up on the treatment of AFib. It's just switching the strategy. That number of people is less and less nowadays because we're catching AFib earlier and earlier. So you're not going to see as much of a progression of AFib. And if we Look on the right, the actual prevalence at AFib right now in the US is estimated around 6 million people. And that number is just going to go up astronomically as people live longer because age is one of the top risk factors for AFib. Obesity is an epidemic and obesity is a risk factor for AFib. So we're gonna see those numbers go way up. And that's what you see on that graph on the bottom screen going from 6 million to about 16 million in the next three decades. And if you look at age, as I mentioned, that's one of the number one risk factors for AFib, especially when you get to age over 65 and in particular over 75. And as you go up in age and your risk of AFib goes up, so does your risk of stroke related to AFib because not everyone has the same risk. So another analogy I like to use is electrical arthritis. So just like you get arthritis in your knee or any of your joints and that scar tissue buildup, you get scar tissue buildup in your electrical system of the heart, and that can contribute to developing AFib. So if we take a step back and look at any health condition, we think about risk factors. What are the different health conditions or medical conditions that can contribute to the development of a disease? So if you look at AFib, I mentioned age is one of the number one risk factors. If you look at any kind of structural heart disease, and whether that's coronary artery disease, or whether that's valvular heart disease, or whether that's heart failure, all the structural components of heart disease can contribute to AFib. Sleep apnea is a huge risk factor for AFib and very much underappreciated. We have a low threshold as electrophysiologists to recommend a home sleep study screen because it's so pervasive. And risk factors of sleep apnea include things like obesity, 
And you'll find that weight is so, so closely tied to AFib. Weight contributes to diabetes, which contributes to AFib. It contributes to high blood pressure, which contributes to AFib. And it contributes to sleep apnea. And there's two kinds of sleep apnea. There's obstructive sleep apnea where you have snoring. And then there's central sleep apnea where the brainstem control of breathing is not functioning right. So no one may realize they're having it. A partner who may be in bed with the patient may not realize that these breath holding spells are occurring. But every time there's an episode where someone holds their breath or stops breathing, that drop in oxygen has a direct effect on the electrical system of the heart and a variety of other factors that promotes AFib. And then if we look at premature atrial contractions, so these are extra beats that we used to think of just as benign, and in many cases are, but if someone has enough of them, if someone has a high frequency, that's now been found to be an independent risk factor for atrial fibrillation. And so we often think of AFib as a accumulation of different risk factors coming together, so-called perfect storm to create that first AFib episode. And if we think of the triggers of AFib, it's kind of like thinking of the risk factors, but the triggers are triggering an individual episode. So we have many of our patients ask, well, why did I go into AFib that particular day? It could be because they were dehydrated. It could be because they were under a lot of stress. They weren't sleeping well. So usually there's not one thing. And it's all about doing that detective work of thinking back to, you know, what were those different factors that uh, were at play? Alcohol is something that we're increasingly recognized as a big risk factor and trigger for AFib. In fact, there was a recent study out of the UK that showed that, and this was about 15, 20,000 patients that showed that very moderate alcohol alcohol intake, maybe a glass a day, had a high association with the development of AFib. Caffeine is also a trigger for AFib by stimulating adrenaline, causing dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Electrolyte deficiencies such as magnesium and potassium can be big triggers for AFib, so that's why we often recommend a magnesium supplement to many patients. Interestingly, eating can be a trigger for AFib. So the gastrointestinal system, and in particular the esophagus and other aspects of the GI system, have a shared nervous system to the heart, the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system connects all of our organs. But in particular, the vagus nerve, which is the counterbalance to your fight or flight response, it's your rest and relax or rest and digest response, it can be a trigger for AFib and it can be a trigger for GI issues. So we'll often see GI issues trigger AFib and vice versa. In fact, I had a patient that when she developed bad acid reflux, it would send her into AFib. And it's not just that nervous system connection. The esophagus and the left atrium are literally right next to each other, to the point that when we do this procedure AFib ablation, we're monitoring the esophagus to make sure there's no signs of injury as we do ablation. So AFib, it's all about identifying risk factors. It's all about identifying triggers. But then you want to think of like, how do you diagnose it? And I mentioned with Esther's case, we were fortunate. She happened to be in AFib when she came into the office. And so the EKG revealed it. In many cases, people may feel symptoms such as racing heartbeat, feeling fatigued. Classically with AFib, especially early on, you have days where you're feeling great, and then you have days where you feel terrible. And that's that paroxysmal AFib where you go in and out of it. And that's where it's really important to get in tune with how do you check your pulse? in your carotid artery, in your radial artery. It should be like a metronome. And when you feel the sort of erratic component, that could be AFib. Now, not all irregular beats are AFib. You can have premature beats, skipping beats, which are often benign. So it's important to talk with your doctor about the difference between the two and really how to monitor for it. And of course, now we have an explosion of wearable devices. Cardia Mobile is a finger pad sensor that works with a smartphone that can do a single lead EKG that you can do a recording right then and there. And it's reasonably able to detect AFib. There are definitely limitations with these devices. And this also includes the Apple Watch, that in general, there's about an 80% ability for these to detect AFib accurately. But there are cases where if there's not good electrode contact with the skin, you may not get a good reading. In general, if it shows normal rhythm with some of these wearable devices, it's usually pretty reliable, but these are not in hard and fast rules and you definitely need to discuss it with your doctor. So with regards to the monitoring of the heart, we're monitoring the rhythm. We're monitoring the rhythm through a variety of different technologies, some of which we'll talk about today, and that's for diagnosis, but then also treatment. Let's get back to that electrical cancer analogy. When someone has cancer, you treat the tumor and then you monitor it. 
whether it's a mammogram for breast cancer, whether it's a PSA for, for prostate cancer, whether it's a CAT scan to mo monitor any kind of cancer. Well, we need to have the same thing for this electrical cancer. So we have wearable monitors, we have monitors that are used for two weeks, for four weeks, and then we have implantable monitors, which is an amazing piece of technology that we've become very reliant upon nowadays. And we'll talk about that as Medtronic was actually one of the pioneers for that. And when you use the monitoring, you can actually detect any recurrences of AFib early and you can act on it because the quicker you detect it and the quicker you act on it, the better outcome you're gonna be. So a big take home point today, early detection, early intervention results in a better outcome. And so that's why monitoring is so critical. And you have to be engaged in that. You can't necessarily rely just on your healthcare providers. It is upon the individual to monitor their AFib. I always tell my patients, get up in the morning, brush your teeth, check your pulse. It's just a good habit to be in. You obviously don't want to be obsessed about monitoring your rhythm. So it's always finding that balance, isn't it? So these are the kinds of monitors that I was referring to. The Holter monitor is a 24-hour heart rhythm monitor. It has limited value with AFib because it's such a small sampling time. You're only monitoring the heart for 24 hours. And if AFib comes and goes, you may have an episode of AFib once every six months or maybe a couple of times a month. So you may not catch it with a Holter. A telemetry monitor is good for about four weeks. And this uses wireless technology that allows you basically a cell phone that allows you to take rhythm data and send it to your doctor's office. What's nice about these is that they can detect AFib that you don't feel, the silent AFib we talked about. The patch monitor has been a great piece of technology. It's much more patient-centered because it's easier to deal with. You're not having all these wires connected to you. It's basically like an oversized Band-Aid with a microchip in it. It's waterproof. You can shower with it. It's good for about two weeks, and they're working on technology for longer monitoring. Traditionally, it's monitoring that's done, recorded, sent in, and then processed. There are now devices that can actually send data in real time. So what I mean by that is if you're wearing it and you have an episode of AFib, there are monitoring companies that will actually notify the doctor within a certain time period that person's having AFib. Whereas before you had to wait until the end of the monitoring period to get all the results. And then I was alluding to this earlier, but we have these different wearable technologies. Here's the Cardio Mobile that you see on the top. Here's the Apple Watch EKG where you put your finger on the side of the watch on the crown to record an EKG rhythm. And there's ways to send this to your doctor to have it for review. Some of these companies also offer a service where a doctor can overread your tracings, an independent doctor. So there's a couple of different ways to manage these. And then the implantable monitor, and that's really been a game changer for us. It's, the technology has actually been around for several years, but it's really been fine-tuned and made so much more patient-friendly in the last few years. So implantable monitor, I'd referred to it a few different times. Why use an implantable monitor? Well, again, it's electrical cancer, it's sneaky, it's subtle, it can recur without realizing it, it can occur without realizing it. So you wanna have some way to monitor AFib on a day-to-day, -day, minute to minute basis. And you wanna not worry, am I in AFib? Am I not in AFib? So these devices take that worry out of the equation. It continuously records your rhythm. It applies a software algorithm that basically detects episodes of AFib as well as other rhythm issues, slow heartbeat for people who faint and other different uh, rhythm disorders. And it sends that information to your doctor's office. And now the implantable monitors, they used to have to work with a base station that you plugged in next to your bed. Now they can work with a smartphone app. And basically anywhere you have a cell signal, that data can get transmitted to your doctor's office. Monitor gets implanted, and then you essentially don't have to worry about it because that data is being transmitted to your doctor's office. One caveat though, if you get one of these monitors, is it is important to be involved. It is important to make sure and check in with your doctor, say, hey, are you getting the transmissions? Most practices are pretty good about having a, a QA and a fail safe to make sure that if someone's monitor is unplugged or something that we're need to follow up with that person. But I always tell my patients, you know, you have this implantable device, you know, you need to also share that responsibility. But this device is, it's not invasive. It's right underneath the skin. It's not within the heart. People often ask that. It's literally just underneath the skin. So it helps you quantify the amount of AFib someone's having. You get, actually get percentages, you get charts. So if there are any of those engineers out there, people love this because they can see all sorts of data. It assesses disease 
progression or recurrence. It can guide treatment decisions. So say I have a patient like Esther with AFib and I decide to do a cardioversion and shock their heart back to, into rhythm, shock her heart back into rhythm. I can use this monitor to say, well, four months from now, I can see if she had an episode of AFib, I can act on it right away to say, okay, Esther, okay, we're not gonna do a cardioversion again because your AFib came back. We've already optimized your triggers. Let's consider, for example, an ablation procedure. So it can guide those treatment decisions. You can visually see those responses. And importantly, in terms of stroke prevention, the key to stroke prevention is really to help reduce any chance of clot formation with AFib. And when the heart doesn't beat properly, and when the heart is chaotically beating and you're not getting good contraction, especially in left atrium, there's a structure called the left atrial appendage, which forms these blood clots that basically can break off and go anywhere. They can go to the brain and cause a stroke. That's how a stroke happens with AFib, but they can go to other arterial systems. So in many cases, we will use a blood thinner to protect someone. And the decision-making about blood thinners has to do essentially with two acronyms, one called chads Vask one called has bled and essentially assesses someone's risk of stroke with AFib versus their risk of bleeding on a blood thinner. And we can use these implantable devices to help guide these decisions. If you don't see AFib for a certain segment of time, maybe you have a discussion with your doctor about the pros and cons of continuing a blood thinner, for example. Or if you can't take a blood thinner, if you have a contraindication to a blood thinner, you know, the device can be used to at least give a level of assurance that we're going to be catching episodes of silent AFib and, and act on it. And so it can guide treatment decisions. It can assess symptom and rhythm correlation. So that's a key thing with any of these heart rot monitors, including the implantables, is that we can tell people, if you feel a symptom, you can press a button in the case of the wearable devices, or in the case of the implantable device, you can use a tool that basically it's a little device that will timestamp your symptoms so that a doctor can look at the rhythm at the time of the symptoms and say, oh yeah, that was an episode of AFib, or no, that was just a premature beat, or hey, your rhythm was normal, it must be something else. So it really does help quite a bit in diagnostic and therapeutics. And as I mentioned, Mentronic has been the pioneer for these implantable monitors. And originally we had the Reveal Link, which is about a third of a size of a AAA battery. And a three-year battery life, it's fully MRI compatible. That question comes up a lot. It's fully MRI compatible. You can travel the world with this. You don't even realize in most cases that you even have it. It's not a pacemaker. It's not implanted in the heart. And then on the right, we see the newest generation, the Link 2, which is something that we have all been excited to get because it works with a smartphone app and it makes it so much easier. It has a longer battery life of four years. It's MRI compatible. And it has one of the most accurate software to detection algorithms on the market for detection of any kind of AFib. And so the info, I alluded to it earlier, but the info gets to your doctor from the device that it goes in the case of the newest generation link to your smartphone to then the doctor's office. And with the old generation link, we have this base station that's plugged in next to the bed. And you can use that with the new generation as well. Let's get back to treating AFib. We talked about risk factors. We talked about triggers. And I like to think of the risk factors. If you think of a fire, the risk factors are like wood. The triggers are like the matches and the fire is AFib. And so if risk factors are not optimized and not treated, meaning obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, if those are not treated, no matter what is used as a treatment of AFib, whether it's an ablation or drug, that AFib is almost guaranteed to come back. AFib is not a disease of the heart, it's a disease of the body. It's a body out of balance. And so we can have people that had a great result with an AFib ablation, but their AFib came back. And it's not because necessarily the tissue grew back, it's because the person's still overweight or the blood pressure is uncontrolled. So you need to treat the risk factors. So if you imagine that wood and that fire, if the risk factors are not treated, that wood is getting drier and drier and drier. And then one day you get dehydrated or you have a lot of stress or you have alcohol and that sets you into that episode of AFib and that's like the match. And so to really control that fire, we need to work on both the risk factors, the wood, as well as the matches, the triggers. And so when we think about AFib, the cornerstone of treatment is really prevention of stroke. We also want to control the heart rate from getting too fast. And then in many cases, in most cases nowadays, we at least try to get someone into rhythm. Now, there are definitely cases where we don't in terms of a risk to benefit analysis for a given patient. And that's the key. It's an individual disease. 
one size does not fit all. You need to talk with your doctor, you need to get informed and, and challenge your doctor and say, well, okay, you know, wh why am I not a candidate for a drug or why am I a candidate for ablation or why should I get a pacemaker or why should, you know, I just be on a blood thinner? You know, there's, there's a thought process that goes into that and you really need to look at an individual patient. Risk factor and trigger modification is a part of the treatment algorithm. There's studies that have been shown that people who get an ablation, for an example, have a better outcome if you lose weight, if you treat all the different risk factors. So the heart rate is that number, the beats per minute. The heart rhythm is whether it's normal sinus rhythm or whether it's something chaotic like AFib. So in many cases, we try to restore the rhythm back to normal sinus. By controlling the rate and improving the rhythm, you're gonna help prevent heart failure. And the end result of all of this is the hope to improve quality of life. I should make a mention too about AFib in terms of the silent AFib. It's not uncommon. We'll get a call from an anesthesiologist or a primary care physician, person's going in for surgery, gallbladder surgery, for example, on their pre-op EKG, they're in AFib had no idea. Well, the key is to really ask that person, well, if you think about it in the last six months, have you had any change in your exercise tolerance? Have you any change in your energy level? And that can be a tip off that the person actually has symptoms from AFib and it's not until you restore the rhythm that you do actually see an improvement in symptoms. We have medications, medications that are used to keep people in rhythm or convert the rhythm, which are antiarrhythmic drugs. The challenge with these is that they have a lot of toxicities, especially as people get older, some of which are life-threatening. We really, while they do have a role, we're trying to use those less and less by and large. You have rate control drugs, which are like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers to simply control the heart rate. They don't do a great job of restoring the rhythm or keep people in rhythm, but they sometimes can. And there is a role for drugs, but it's important to know there are so many treatment options out there. And you really want to think about seeing an AFib specialist, a heart rhythm specialist, an electrophysiologist. You can go to websites like stopafib.org to get more information. The Heart Rhythm Society has upbeat.org, which allows you to actually put in a zip code and you can locate an AFib specialist anywhere near you. Cardioversion is a procedure where you shock the heart back into rhythm. You're resetting the heart rhythm and it's done as an outpatient. It's done very easily. It's non-invasive. The issue is it it's resets the rhythm, but it doesn't do anything to prevent the AFib from recurring. And that's an important thing. You have to prevent the AFib from recurring. So then we get to catheter ablation. And catheter ablation is a, an amazing technology. It's been out for several decades, but it's undergone multiple evolutions. And so importantly, you need to get updated information. You'll hear people say, well, I have a friend who had five AFib ablations and it didn't work, or my doctor didn't recommend an AFib ablation. Well, maybe in some cases that's true, but in a lot of cases, the person or the information is not up to date. We get up to date all the time as electrophysiologists. We know the latest advancements that Medtronic may produce or another company may produce that can offer more treatments to patients with AFib that were no previously not considered to be candidates. Persistent AFib, for example, people in continuous AFib, in the past, we often would just treat those patients with drugs. We now know that things like catheter ablation can actually be very effective, and you have to individualize. If you optimize the risk factors and you ablate, in some cases, you may or may not use a drug. You can get people who were in AFib for a long period of time back into normal rhythm. My favorite story is a patient I had, we got him back into rhythm. It was a combination of ablation and short-term drug therapy. Again, electrical cancer, metastatic cancer, it can be treated. Sometimes it's not one modality. Sometimes with cancer, you take out the tumor, you give chemotherapy. In the case of AFib, sometimes you ablate and you give a medication like chemotherapy. So with ablation, we really do the diagnostic part. It's almost like a cardiac canvas and we're painting the heart. The catheters have multiple electrodes which collect electrical information from the heart, from within the heart, and then it displays it in a color format to basically tell us where is normal, where is abnormal, how healthy is the heart. And there's different types of catheters from different manufacturers. AFib ablation is done basically all through an IV, an IV that's put typically in your femoral vein, which is in the area of the groin. There's a large vein there. We essentially assert a large IV, which is called a sheath. And through that, we insert all the different pieces of equipment. We have different kinds of catheters, which are long flexible tubes that can map the AFib, that can ablate the AFib. We have ways of cauterizing AFib, of freezing AFib, all these different technologies. The end result is you're trying to repair broken wires. 
AFib is a series of broken wires. You're trying to repair the insulation. Ablation takes that abnormal tissue and converts it to healthy scar tissue. Scar is an electrical insulator. It prevents those impulses from triggering AFib. So AFib and ablation is like repairing the insulation. Drug therapy is like duct tape. There's a role for duct tape. Sometimes the duct tape works for someone's entire lifetime, but in many cases that duct tape peels off. So drugs may work for a while and then stop working. And that's generally the idea behind ablation. So here you see on the left, three-dimensional mapping that we use of the left atrium. These structures that you see, these tubular structures are the pulmonary veins, which are the source of AFib. We're looking at the left side of the heart, the right side of the heart would be over here and the bottom chambers would be here. And here's an example where we see this white circle. That's the delineation between the left atrium and the pulmonary veins. And when you do, this is the before, when you do an ablation and then after you do an ablation, you remap and you see this color change from purple to red, red meaning that the AFib signals are now gone. And so I like to send people pictures of these so they can really understand what was done. Pulmonary vein isolation, which is the hallmark of treatment of AFib ablation, is where we essentially encircle this broken wire with an ablation technology. Medtronic has an amazing technology called cryo balloon. It makes it really easy for the physician to set that balloon. It does a circumferential freeze and basically creates a moat around a castle. The castle is AFib. We're creating a moat around the castle with the ablation technology. With regards to ablation and the energy sources, there are studies that have been shown that cryoablation or freezing and radio frequency are fairly equivalent in terms of outcome. And there are pros and cons to both. Sometimes a physician may only be familiar with one type. It's best to be familiar with all types. There's other technologies like laser, for example, that are used in some cases, but by and large, we have cryo and we have radio frequency. Sometimes you have other arrhythmias you need to ablate where you use radio frequency for that, for example, something called atrial flutter, which is commonly ablated in addition to AFib in certain cases. But essentially you go up that femoral vein, you go across the interatrial septum, which separates the two sides of the heart. We go into the left atrium and then we have the pulmonary vein here and we encircle it here with the cryo balloon, here with radio frequency. Radio frequency is like point by point drawing a circle. Cryo balloon is all in one fell swoop. We also have robotic ablation and Mission is actually my hospital's one that has the system and it uses magnetic fields to guide the catheter and there's a role for that in some settings too. Cryoballoon ablation is very simple to do from a physician standpoint. You insert the catheter, you inflate the balloon, you deliver the freezing agent which creates the freeze. And so it is actually a very simple technique and ablation is all in any procedure is all about how many has your doctor done? How many has the hospital done? Do they have the access to the latest technology? What's their complication rate? What technology do they have available? And it's also important to know that you individualize. People may go in, for example, for one type of procedure, a cryo balloon, you may have to pull out a radio frequency catheter to touch up areas, or you may go in for a radio frequency and realize you're not getting all the tissue and you trade it up for a cryo balloon. So it's not necessarily an either or, it's a toolbox that your physician has. So what's exciting in our field is we've seen recently, in the past, people who got ablation, they had to fail a drug. Well, now there have been studies done that show that if you go to a, an ablation early on in the treatment algorithm, you actually have better outcomes. You have less progression of the disease. You have lower recurrences. So a much lower threshold to recommend ablation. And again, be careful about what you hear. People may say so-and-so had multiple ablations. Maybe that's because the risk factors weren't treated. Maybe because that they had an older form of technology. Maybe that's because the left atrium was very, very enlarged. The left atrium and the size of the left atrium is one of the biggest predictors of AFib recurrence. So those are important things to know. And that's an actual important number for your doctor to talk with you about. And so cryoballoon is now considered in many cases first line treatment. And it can actually be approved for that or has been approved for that in certain cases. We have AV node ablation, which is often coupled with a pacemaker. The Medtronic's nice because they have a couple of different pacemaker options that are good for that one in which in case is actually leadless. So a lot of information. We're available offline. Please reach out to us for any additional questions. We'll be going to a QA and a at the end with Melanie. But remember, early detection, early intervention, AFib is progressive, AFib begets AFib, sinus rhythm begets sinus rhythm, and you have to be informed and be in control. And so I'll turn the floor back over to Melanie. Thank you very much for your attention.
Dr. Desai, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. And in fact, you answered a lot of the questions that have come in so far, but we still have a lot more questions. But before we do, um, let's turn the floor over to a special guest. We're excited to have with us today, Michael, who is one of Dr. Desai's patients. And Michael, thank you for joining us this afternoon and thank you for being willing to share your experiences in living with AFib. Thank, thank you, Michael. So why don't we start with, um, tell us about getting diagnosed with your AFib. Well, I was diagnosed, I just was going in for a physical, my early physical and um, everything was going fine. And we were discussing my, I had high blood pressure for years and um, we were discussing the high blood pressure and she was checking my heartbeat and she says, how do you feel? I go, I feel fine. She says, lay down if your heart feels like it's going to ready to bounce out of your chest. So she laid me down and she put an EKG on me and she says, you got to, we're going to get you to a cardiologist right away. So um, she got a hold of Dr. Asai and he saw me in a, within a day and <laughs> there I went. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, tell us a little bit more about what you and Dr. Desai talked about in selecting your treatment plan. Well, he gave me the options um, and then I kind of read up on it. He gave me all the options and I eliminated the medication. I didn't want to be put on medication for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> um, we discussed it and um, I just jumped at, at, at the um, abula abulation right away because that's, as I read up on it and checked on it, it seemed like that was the best way to go. So what was it that made that ablation more compelling to you than other treatment options? Well, um, medication was, I didn't, I've been on heart medication before and I don't, it slows me up. It makes me tired. And um, after I was diagnosed, I realized what, you know, that, that the, the AFib that I was diagnosed with was um, the last year or two, it was my, my uh, way of life had declined very, very drastically. I, drastically. I, I was tired every, every day coming home from work. I, I was used to working out every day and I wasn't working out at hardy hardly anymore so my quality of life had gone way down and um and I didn't want to be put on medication and I thought that was what I read and what we discussed with that the fibrillation would uh was was the best way to go I did mm -hmm. so why don't you share with us a little bit more about having the cryoablation procedure and how you felt afterwards and, and maybe even what kind of restrictions you had or when you were able to go back to doing things normally? Well, um, the fibrillation went great. It was very simple. I went in in the morning. They did the pre-op for me and they put me out. I woke up a few couple hours later and went home and had dinner with the family that night. <laughs> Wow. I woke up the next morning feeling good. Went for my morning walk, and <laughs> and I was actually I was ready to go back to work in two days, but they didn't want me to come back for a, a week. They made me stay at home. So, <laughs> but um, the procedure was 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 great. I mean, it was as simple as could be. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, I understand that you are a cyclist, and yes. so how long did you hold off on cycling before you went back to that? about four days, three, four days. <laughs> and I started, I'm, I'm back to uh, the swimming. I get up at, uh, at 4.30 in the morning. I'm in the pool by five o'clock in the morning and swim laps now for 45 minutes to an hour before I go to work in the morning. Wow. And uh, I tell you this, it's, it seems kind of strange, but is this, I'm, I was glad I was diagnosed with it. It's, yeah. it's really got my quality of life back, back to me. And uh, my family is, they've noticed a, a huge difference in me and it's um, it was really a, a good uh, it was a blessing that blessing to be, to be diagnosed with it. Yeah, so it sounds like this was a really good decision to have the cryoablation, and that it effectively gave you your life back. So, 
what did you and Dr. Desai uh, decide uh, regarding the link uh, to monitor your heart? Um, how did that come up? And, you know, was it done at the same time as your ablation? Tell us a little bit more about having the link monitor implanted or inserted. Because it's not really implanted. It's more of a just, you know, you know, quick insertion. Dr. Asai explained to me what the what it was, and it just it was it just gave me a, a peace of mind. Um, it was done at the same time as as the ab ablation, so it was. And I actually I don't even notice it's there right now, so I. Okay. So um, I just go on with my life, and it's it's not changing anything. Um. So that was basically it. <laughs> wow, that that's great. So, um, are you, um, you know, having, are you having any thoughts about what other people should know if they're thinking about having a cryoablation or getting a link monitor or, or other implanted heart monitor? What would you tell people um, about having these procedures? I would, I would, I wouldn't hesitate. Because I had never heard of it before, I I didn't know. It was just a blessing that I that the, that that my I went in for my physical and then she discovered it. Yeah, that's, you know, it's fantastic that you were able to get treated so promptly. Um, very often, people don't get referred to a specialist like Dr. Desai, an, an electrophysiologist, and they don't always get the treatment as quickly as you did. So I think you're, you know, you had an absolutely ideal situation, and I think it's wonderful that you've been able to get your life back from it. And so, Michael, thank you for sharing with us about what your experience is has been experience has been and so what i'd like to do is bring back in uh dr desai and let's um you know have the q a session and um there may be some questions in here for you as well michael and um so let me let me actually start with an an easy question that's come in for dr desai um and so and, and let me let me mention um there is the question and answer box, and that's where you'll put in your uh, questions for this Q&A session. And um, just one quick thought is don't share with us a lot of personal information, because if we ask that question, um, that personal information will live on on the internet forever. So we want to try to keep it um, not um, personal, um, more uh, general questions. There's a question that comes in quite often, and there were variations of it here. So let's address this one first, and then I have a bunch of other questions to go to. Do you have to be in AFib during the ablation in order for you to find all, you know, to, to find what needs to be treated? Or is it really necessary to, to be in AFib at that time? That, that's that's a great question, Melanie. And if I may, there were just a couple other points I wanted to make. Okay. Success rate of ablation, success rate is around 85, sometimes up to 90% now with mm -hmm. cryobaloon or rating frequency in paroxysmal patients. In persistent patients, that number is going up more and more. We've seen success rates as high as 80%. If you have a redo ablation, the success rate goes up even more that you really need to individualize to the patient in terms of the success rates. The risk is about one to 2% for major complications and definitely can talk with your doctor about it. It's a great question about AFib in terms of do you need to be in it. So other rhythms that we deal with like supraventricular tachycardia or SVT, we need to have the person in the rhythm or be able to induce it to map it. With AFib, fortunately in vast majority of cases, it originates from the pulmonary veins. So you can actually see these signals in the pulmonary veins when you put a catheter there, they're called pulmonary vein potentials. The great thing about the cryo balloon is you literally can see the signals go away right in front of your eyes. So in Mike, Michael's case, it was wonderful because he was in a, he was actually in a fib when he came in and then we were able to get him into rhythm during the procedure, which was a wonderful thing to see. And then we try to reinduce a fib at the end. So the answer to the question is you do not need to be in a fib. You do not need to be in sinus rhythm. You can be in whatever rhythm you are in and we can adjust and we can map in different 
strategies. And it's, uh, it's really helpful in that regard. And we always check for the sites outside of the pulmonary veins at the time of the ablation that we can certainly answer that question uh, offline if people have a question about that in terms of where other spots are coming from. And one last point I wanted to make was just that with regards to the implantable monitor, like in Michael's case, I just actually looked at some of his data recently. We get information about rhythm, sinus rhythm, AFib, we get percentages, we get graphs. And so it's, it's really a, a helpful piece of technology that you can also share with your patients. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So a question um, is, why does the heart rate increase after an ablation? And how long does that typically last at the higher rate? And this particular person said that his or her um, heart rate was 15 beats per minute higher than normal. And, and just a question that comes from some of the others that have come in, is that more typical in an athlete or does that happen with everyone or is that just certain people? And what do we know? I love that question because it's actually a very sophisticated question. It's so AFib is closely tied to the autonomic nervous system, your sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight, which raises your heart rate and your parasympathetic or rest and relax, your vagus nerve, which lowers the heart rate. So people are highly athletic, highly conditioned. They often have low resting heart rates. That's actually now a risk factor for AFib, especially high endurance athletes, extreme sports, very low resting heart rate. There may be genetic components as well. But the reason why you see this elevation in pulse rate afterwards, actually it's a good sign in many cases. So the parasympathetic, what we call plexi, innervate or send nerves into an area right near the pulmonary veins. So you have what we call ganglionic plexi and they're actually right around the pulmonary veins. So it kind of all makes sense that when you do an ablation, you're actually modifying the nerve. You're modifying the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic nerve system that goes into the heart that acts as a trigger for AFib. So what happens even during the procedure is when we apply cryo, the freeze, we can actually see the heart rate slow way down. And that's a vagal response. That's a sign that you're actually affecting the, the parasympathetic nervous system. And so that what we call denervation actually can have a antiarrhythmic effect or a beneficial effect because a low resting heart rate facilitates having extra beats. But when your heart rate goes up, your own heartbeat actually suppresses the premature beats that trigger AFib. So you're really suppressing the triggers. That high rate does go down over time in the vast majority of patients, but it's not a bad sign of anything. It's actually a sign that you had an impact on the parasympathetic nervous system. Right. How long does it typically take for it to go down? Because that's a constant question in the AFib patient yeah. community. Yeah. People are asking, what should I expect? Yeah, it, it usually actually takes a few months. So it's not like a week. It's not like a few days. It can take a few months. And definitely getting back into regular aerobic exercise, the same thing that helped kind of keep your heart rate under control, mm -hmm. like that actually will help to reset your autonomic nervous system. Because again, the heart rate, it's this dance. It's the seesaw mm -hmm. between sympathetic and parasympathetic. So the, 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 the effect on the nerve that occurs, it's not like a damaging effect. It's not a bad effect. It's actually... Mm -hmm. A, a good sign that you're impacting the uh, uh, parasympathetic nervous system. But to answer the question, yeah, sometimes it can take a few months so to not panic. Okay. And that's great. That helps us understand um, and and people to, to know what to expect. So it sounds right. like that probably may go along with the blanking period, the three months after or so after the ablation, um, that things are kind of healing and getting back to normal. Right. right. Exactly. Right. So um, we're running out of time, but just a couple of really quick questions. Um, this one is hopefully, this one's not so easy and not so quick, but let's see if we can kind of um, um, hit it very briefly. How do you decide whether someone should be on an anticoagulation, uh, anticoagulant after their ablation? Great question. So by and large, the guidelines are people need to be on a minimum of three months after an ablation. That comes from the Heart Rhythm Society and other international bodies. So three months. And the reason for that is, as you alluded to, Melanie, you, you have a period of time afterwards where there's a lot of inflammation in the heart. It is common to have AFib after the procedure. It does not mean it didn't work. But because of that reason, that's why we have people on blood thinners. And then at the three-month mark, the decision about blood thinner is made based on Chad's ask and has blood. 
Like those are the two that people should ask their doctors about. These are acronyms, but there's like calculators. You can Google Chad's VASC and Hasblood and literally put in the numbers for the different factors that are involved. And that's how you make a decision about long-term blood thinner or not. Right, right. Awesome. So hopefully this one's a fairly quick question and it is around um, if I'm ha- if I go into AFib while I'm golfing or exercising, should I stop? Is it dangerous for the heart? Yeah, great question. So, you know, it's all about symptoms. So if you're feeling lightheaded, if your pulse rate is really, really fast, if you're feeling really short of breath, absolutely stop. Because the more active you are in AFib, the higher your heart rate's going to go. So generally speaking, if you're if you go into AFib during that physical activity, you should probably back off. You should probably hydrate. You should probably rest. That'll bring your pulse rate back down. That's a separate issue than like when you're in AFib, it doesn't mean that you're sort of like confined and you can't exercise. People often ask that. You know, we want to encourage people to exercise. It's not like you have a blocked artery where you have to be careful, but it's just that heart rate. You just have to be careful about the heart rate not going too fast. Right, right. So as much as I would love to tackle a whole lot more of these questions, we, I know you need to get back, uh, Dr. Desai, and we don't want to hold people too long. And so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and give a special thank you to Dr. Desai and to Michael for their excellent presentations and for sharing with us their experiences in managing atrial fibrillation. And to let you know, if you want to watch this again, um, the replays will be available as soon as they can get processed and you'll receive notification as to when those replays are available. So have a great afternoon and thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.